and even our pastor and worship leader weren't here this morning, so that was very interesting. Yeah, I guess they're both. Yeah, I know he indicated he's a deer enthusiast. And, yeah. well, who's on the phones outside? Wanda and Brad. Oh, Wanda and Brad. Okay. Brad. Wanda and Brad, okay, and good. also uh, Tracy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Roger. 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 We're glad to have you. Welcome. Roger. Roger is a friend of mine, guys. Uh, Roger is on the To begin, and as we begin today, we're going to talk about uh, how Jesus encounters two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Uh, last week, uh, Randy talked to us about the empty tomb on Easter morning, how uh, the women had gone there, and how uh, the two disciples ran and uh, went to see for themselves, and how the grave clothes uh, were laid, and all, all of that. And now we're going to see after all that had occurred, we're going to see how Jesus approached two disciples along the road to Emmaus, uh, how their hearts had burned when Jesus uh, talks with them, and yet they didn't recognize him. And we'll be talking about all this, and then Jesus taught the disciples how to read the Old Testament, uh, making sure that as we read the Old Testament, it's for us today that we see Jesus as the focus of both the Old and the New Testament. It's the only way it's going to truly uh, make sense. And then we're going to see that Jesus is the Word made flesh, and He wasn't only uh, a pattern for right reading God's Word for the people uh, in the past, but it's also for us as we uh, begin today. So we're going to just jump right in. And uh, we're in Luke chapter 24, so if you don't have a book, go ahead and turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to begin uh, with Randy. He's going to read verses 17 through 24 for us. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas, Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened here, there in these days? What things, he asked them. So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb. When they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. Okay, we see that these two disciples are walking along and they're talking about Jesus' arrest and his crucifixion. Uh, notice that this two events had crushed their hopes that he might be the Messiah, that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. Uh, they talked about uh, tales of angels and an empty tomb, but, but Jesus was nowhere to be found. Uh, but they presupposed that he might be alive as he had, had told them. And so we, they knew some details, but they didn't know all of them. They were just trying to ponder them and try and make what sense they could of it. Uh, when we have a time of uh, disagreement and discouragement, uh, we need to understand that uh, 
just as these people were concentrating upon their circumstances and the things that were happening uh, immediately to them, they needed to uh, look above their circumstances. And so as they were walking along and as they were disputing it, notice that they were disagreeing upon what these thought, uh, things really had met. Jesus comes up to them and they don't know who he is. And uh, when he asks them, you know, what are you talking about? It says they stopped walking. It's like they're stopped in their tracks. What? You don't know what's going on. You don't understand that, you know, all these things that have happened. And notice it says, and they look discouraged. So this is what Jesus saw. He saw the discouragement upon their face. And then uh, Cleopas uh, said, are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happening? Uh, he was astounded that this stranger would ask him about what was going on as if he thought the whole world uh, actually knew. Notice that uh, they had hoped that the Messiah uh, and all the prophecies about him were going to uh, come true all at once. They were looking mainly, as were most of the Jews, for a deliverer. Now here we come back once again between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. That before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that the Jews believed that there was just one coming of Christ. And so they combined all the events together. And so they thought when Jesus came, he was going to be the great deliverer. He's going to overthrow the Roman government. He was going to establish the kingdom of David and Solomon. And he was going to put down all their enemies. And once again, they would become this great uh, nation upon the earth. But like so many, and even a lot today, don't understand is that uh, there is a difference between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. I've used this illustration before. When we were younger and we were traveling, uh, we, there were four boys in my family. and So my dad and my mom would load up the station wagon and we take a trip you know for a couple weeks every year and we came to uh the what are they called the mountain range out in the west the rockies right yeah the rocky mountains and you know we looked at them and we we're all astounded about all these purple mountains you know uh what a great mountain range it was thinking you know wow this is really something we'd never seen anything like it and we thought it was all one mountain range until we got on top of the third mountain range. And then we saw there's this great valley and then there was another mountain range behind it. And that's really the way we should understand the difference between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. Is while they were looking afar off, both things were in the future to the Old Testament, they looked at it as if it was just one mountain range, as if it was just one occurrence of the coming of Christ. But what it really was after the first coming where Jesus comes uh, as Savior and Lord, we see there's this valley in between uh, some 2,000 years now in between the first coming and the second coming, the second mountain that when Jesus is going to come again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so what Jesus is having to do is help them to understand that there is going to be uh, a time in between his first and the second coming of Christ. And so as we look upon this today, notice that we see that uh, not only were they looking for someone who would be a king and a deliverer and put off the oppressive rule, we see that uh, Jesus' main concern was for them to see he came to be a deliverer who is going to get them out of the tyranny of sin and death through his crucifixion and his resurrection. So, in other words, people had to be in a right relationship with God first before they could really want and expect the second coming of Christ. If, if Jesus did it all at once, they would be in their sins and everybody would have been killed. And so he had to come the first time to be the Savior so that when he comes the second time that he would come for his people uh, when he comes back again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
Now notice here that we're told that the first expectation here they should have had of the Messiah was salvation from sin and death, uh, without which we can't see the kingdom of God. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that uh, Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of our resurrection. In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 15, what you see is that uh, he continually tells them that uh, the different things that happen if there is no resurrection from the dead. You know, people are still lost, they're still in their sins, they're going to go to hell. And we might as well eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die if there is no resurrection. But because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, we have hope because if he is raised one day, uh, we will be raised too. Now, Amen. let me stop here for a moment. We have to have an understanding that salvation is just not a one-time experience that a lot of people look at salvation as being the moment that we pray or the moment we ask or the moment we uh, repent and we believe uh, in Christ and His finished work on the cross, that that's the moment of salvation and that's all that salvation is. But the Bible makes clear to us that there uh, are really three stages of salvation. The first one being justification. And that is the moment that we put our faith in Christ, that the Bible says, uh, and, and for us that's in the past. You know, that's something we did. I did it when I was 18 years old. You know, people, some people do it younger, some people do it later in life. But uh, in the past, we, we are justified, and we know that this is a declaration uh, that's given judicially to us, where God declares us because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, that we are no longer guilty of sin and he brings us into a right relationship with him. So that's the first aspect of salvation. The second aspect of salvation is what we call sanctification and that's the present and that's where the Bible tells us we are being saved. So we have been saved and that's justification. We are being saved and that is we're being saved daily from the power of sin in our lives. Everyone who has become a Christian no longer has to sin. And the Bible makes that very clear, that we now have a choice we didn't have prior to salvation. But we do sin. We know we are sinful creatures. We know that we are tempted uh, by the world, by the flesh, and by the devil. And we know that too often we give in to sin. But we should, on a daily basis, be being saved from the power of sin. Sin no longer has to be a master over us. It no longer uh, can bring condemnation upon us. It no longer is our master. Now Jesus is our master, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can say no to sin. And so this is what the Bible calls maturing in our faith. And then finally... When Jesus comes again, it's what's called glorification. And that's uh, in the future and when we will be, sin, be saved. So justification is in the past. We have been saved. Sanctification is the present. We are being saved. And glorification is the future when we will be saved. And at that time, we will be saved completely from all sin in our life. We'll no longer be able to sin after our glorification. Uh, the Bible says when we see Jesus as he is, we shall know as we are known. So really, those are the three types of uh, salvation. So we need to keep it in mind when we're talking about uh, sin in the life of the Christian, whether we're talking about past, present, <coughs> excuse me, our future. Now, our hope in all of these rests, though, upon Jesus' power uh, that he had when he saved us through his life, his burial, and his resurrection. Everything uh, that we have in victory is based upon what Jesus has done uh, for us. Any questions before we go on about this? Yeah, go ahead. They're talking just, about uh, those three just, uh, phases of being saved. Hang on just a minute, Barry. Barry, hang on just a second, please. 
Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Ed was talking. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Talk about the three phases you're talking about of being saved. Should a person who's being who is justified just made their decision to give their life to Christ and to ask repentance? If they die that instance, they are saved. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to be sure of that. <clears throat> yeah. And the so moment it's not achieved after the third stage. No. 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 Okay. Barry, you had a thought too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just a, a vernacular addition, and Doug, uh, well presented. Yeah, salvation is just not a moment in time of a believing man and woman. Salvation becomes a lifetime of moments. Good point. No, you had a thought there too, I think. Yeah, I just was say, the moment a person believes they are saved, you know, the Bible teaches that, like the thief on the cross, you know, the, the moment he said, you know, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus says, well, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Well, immediately he was saved. And he did go with Jesus that very day uh, into heaven. And so while we talk about this, this is just expressions that we can use because the Bible uses them when it's talking about the Christian in different stages of their life. But... Yeah, the moment a person is saved, they immediately go into the second stage of sanctification. You know, the, the thief on the cross, though he had no time to be sanctified anymore, uh, he went into uh, sanctification at that time. And so we stay in sanctification, though, until we, we die or until Jesus comes again. Those are just the three things that we, we should think about. One of the thoughts... I was looking at Doug, is that uh, these two men, one is named uh, Cleopas, and the other one is unnamed. Um, there are some scholars that believe that this other one was Luke because of his intimate knowledge of this particular event, and, and the, the kind of back and forth that went on with the conversation, and specifically the breaking of the bread and the disappearing of Jesus. All those things could have come to him from another person, but many people speculate that Luke was actually the one who was the other person in this particular story. Just a yeah. thought. Yeah, I don't see how that could be true because Luke wasn't saved until the second journey of Paul. And it's in like Acts 17 <clears throat> when he changes. He's writing about these events mm -hmm. and he says they did this and they did that. But when they come to his hometown, he begins to speak from there upon, we did this and we did that. Mm -hmm. So that's during the second you know, period of pause, uh, evangelistic journey, and this is <clears throat> 30 years oh, before, said. you know, so. But neither one of these were named disciples either. I mean, yeah. whoever it might have been, they're now, not what, named as What such. I've read, uh, it could have been Cleopas' wife. Well, it doesn't say a man or a woman, does it? No. Yeah. And so it could have yeah. been a husband and wife walking along, and naturally there's going to be conflict. You know, they're, they're no, gonna, they're really? Gonna, they're going to have disagreements. Re no, yeah. I can't imagine that, Doug. Why don't you read, read for us the second uh, paragraph on page 104? Uh, the two disciples felt anything but peace as Jesus joined them on the road, and their understanding of the scriptures the Messiah was supposed to reign, not die. He was to be king, not crucified as a criminal. But just as their eyes had not been opened to see Jesus' true identity, their minds and hearts had not yet been opened to understand and believe the truth of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Notice this conversation of the two, though. Uh, it shows their deep interest and concern in the knowledge of things pertaining to Jesus. Uh, the fact of not recognizing Jesus indicates that Jesus did not intend them to recognize him until he wanted to reveal himself to them. So one of the mysterious qualities in the resurrection of the body is this quality of remaining unrecognized until it was fully uh, intended by the Lord. Uh, you got your Bible handy? Yeah. Look at Malachi 3. <clears throat> As I was reading this the other day, I came across an interesting verse in Malachi chapter 3 that these disciples are so interested in the fact about Jesus and their concern for him and wanting to have knowledge. In Malachi 3, 16 and 17, we see, listen to what God thinks about people who love to talk about him. 
Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Just think about that, how wonderful it is. They, these two on the road to Emmaus, you go back to the Old Testament, Malachi says God loves it when his people talk about him, that he's on their heart so much that he's going to set them aside as precious jewels, and he's going to give them a reward in heaven. Now, they don't have to be great preachers. They don't have to be people of renown. They don't have to have done anything special other than they love the Lord and they love to converse about Him. And I thought that verse in Malachi really uh, applies to what we have here, the two who are on the road to Emmaus, that these things happened and it consumed them, uh, these things that were happening uh, in light of Jesus' uh, death and uh, they didn't really understand his resurrection yet. Okay, any comment before we go on to our next point? Okay, if not, we're going to be at Luke 24, and, and Randy's going to read verses 25 through 27. Randy's having a problem with his eyes this morning, so uh, if I mess up, forgive me. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. In the first uh, paragraph on page 105 of your books, it says, Jesus still veiled from their eyes, taught the two disciples that uh, all of God's word points to him. For example, the Messiah is better than Moses, uh, who leads people out of of the eternal bondage of sin and exile from God's presence. He has uh, reconciled us to the Father through His atoning death and glorious resurrection. The promised Messiah is the one the prophets taught about to usher in the new covenant, which, was pro which promised everlasting forgiveness of sin and new hearts. This covenant was sealed with Jesus' blood shed on the cross. Our good came from His suffering. His resurrection confirms all of God's word is true. Now, look for a moment upon Moses and all the prophets. And this is really shorthand, the teacher's book says, really for all the Old Testament scriptures. Moses referring to the law, which is the Pentateuch, or the first five books uh, of the Bible, which was written by Moses. And then the prophets returned to the rest of the Old Testament, and it can be broken down into the prophets and psalms. And the psalms covered what we call uh, the writings or the wisdom literature, which is psalms and proverbs. And then other historical books too, such as uh, history or prophecy, like Esther and uh, Daniel. But now notice the New Testament uh, bears out a number of ways Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament writings through direct prophecies, covenant promises, types, and shadows. The book of Matthew is really written uh, to Jews, and it shows that direct prophecies, all through Matthew you have, and it is written, and then he'll quote Old Testament scripture, and then he'll show how Jesus fulfilled it. Uh, thus it was said about the Messiah, and then here was Jesus and how he fulfilled that prophecy. We see the covenant prophecies. Uh, Paul talks about them in Galatians, how all the promises to Abraham were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. <coughs> we see types. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about uh, types that were in the Old Testament, and it even talks about and said Jesus was the rock that followed them in the wilderness journeys. Uh, this rock that gave them water uh, in the desert. Now that's a type. It doesn't mean literally he was a rock, but it means he was there with them uh, to help them in their struggles. And then there are shadows. And the whole book of Revelation talks about 
how people were shadows and types, how Joseph, uh, you know, not one bad thing in the whole uh, book of Genesis that talks about Joseph has anything negative to say about him. And uh, Joshua, whose name actually means Jesus uh, in the Hebrew rather than, rather than the Greek. And so all these are shadows and types and prophecies uh, and covenant promises which are showing how we should read the Old Testament. We should be looking for Jesus in every passage. And when we were going through the Old Testament, Randy and I were trying to bring that out and trying to show you how these things were pointing forward to Jesus. And now as we read the New Testament, we see how they point back uh, to him. Doug, if I may, if Go I ahead. may interject this, sir. Uh, yeah, in addition, uh, one thing that has helped me through time, and pray for me, guys, I still need more help, but uh, basically the Old Testament is broken down into three categories. The first 17 books are, for the most part, historical. The five books, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, those books are poetical. Job, you know, it's hard for me to believe that Job's poetical, but that's how it's broke down. And then the last 17 books out of the 39 in the Old Testament are poetical. And that really helped me. 17 historical, eight poetical, and 17 prophetical. And that helped me break down the 39 books of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, there are a lot of different ways. I mean, even in in uh, our preschool program here they have children memorizing the books of the bible uh, you know however it helps you to understand is what's important uh, we know they're not in chronological order though uh, there's the jerusalem bible i believe that does put them in chronological order but uh, for the most part that's why you read something and then you'll uh, reread about you know, something that happened before that time, uh, a little bit later on. But, you know, it's all important, but the main thing we need to remember is it's all pointing towards the time where Jesus is going to come and he's going to pay the price uh, to bring people back to God. Notice that what we have here today is that it's teaching us about Scripture and how the Holy Spirit who inspired it also is illuminating it to us. Uh, like the early disciples, <clears throat> we are enabled to read all Scripture in light of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Each part of Jesus' life is important, from his uh, life that he lived, that he lived a perfect life, because Paul tells us that the lamb that was going to be sacrificed had to be without spot or wrinkle. It, it couldn't have any blemishes at all. Uh, this is what was given in Exodus to those who were going to put the blood on the uh, side of the doors and uh, on the top of their posts that uh, it had to be a lamb without spot. It had to be one that uh, wasn't lame or one that uh, wasn't uh, you know, perfect. Now all these things, again, are shadows and types pointing uh, to Jesus, but he had to live a perfect life to be the perfect sacrifice. And then his death, uh, the Bible clearly tells us that our sins were laid upon him, uh, that he died for all who believe upon him, uh, that all their sins were paid for uh, during the time he spent upon the cross. And then we know that finally the Father even had to turn away and break that fellowship uh, that the Trinity has always had up to that point and turn his back on Jesus at the time because he represented uh, all of our sins. But then proof that God accepted him and his sacrifice is that he was raised from the grave. And the great news now is that the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 <clears throat> that Jesus is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. That every day as we stumble along, as we don't know how to pray, as we uh, do our very best, but it's so inadequate. We have one who is on our side, who is uh, praying on our behalf, who is uh, urging us on, who is uh, helping us to do the works that we need to do. 
all this, though, he does through uh, the Holy Spirit that he's placed within us. And this is what he said in John chapter 14. It's imperative to you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, then I can't send the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, he is the spirit of truth. And he will convict you of sin. Uh, and he, he will lead you uh, in all righteousness. And so we have the Holy Spirit today. You know, this goes all the way back to Genesis uh, chapter 3, where it says that uh, God promised Eve that she would bring forth one that would crush the serpent's head, uh, Genesis 3.15. And the ultimate sacrifice to atone for sins as far shown by Israel's tabernacle and temple practices. You know, we, we look at these animal sacrifices, and especially when we get into Leviticus, you know, everybody gets bogged down with Leviticus because it's talking about these sacrifices that have no relation to us because we don't make sacrifices anymore. But he goes in great detail for what sin, what sacrifice was required and how it was needed. <clears throat> and even though it didn't save the believing Israelite in the Old Testament, they still had to do them because it was foreshadowing when the Messiah was going to come and he's going to give his sacrifice once and for all time for sin. And so... Uh, as we look at this, we see that uh, the Prince of Peace uh, is in the Old Testament, the King of Glory, Psalms 24. All these things are uh, given to us and shown to us that Jesus was uh, in the Old Testament as much as in the New Testament. Now notice God continues uh, to work all things new. You know, in fact, the Bible says when a person believes, we become new creatures in Christ Jesus. God, it's been said, has uh, planned his work, and now he's working his plan. Uh, God does not do anything without thinking it out. You know, there is a time where the triune God before the foundation of the world before he ever even created anything, had decided that Jesus was going to come because he knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin and they couldn't be good enough to come back to him. So they decided, the Bible says that Jesus was crucified or the plan was made to crucify him before the foundation of the world. Uh, it just shows that God indeed does plan his work and uh, he continues to work that plan uh, even today. You know, I, I Doug and, and brothers and sisters, I, I still, uh, when I think about God, uh, knowing everything, and the way he structured this in our hope and our faith, I still have a few questions about why he set it up that way. Now, he's a creator and I'm the clay, but yeah, sometimes I, I wonder why it was set up that way. And uh, I guess that the end date of that statement is, thank God it was set up that way. Well, I think Romans 3.25 gives us the answer. It's or 25 or 26, I can't remember. But it says that he might, might remain just and be the justifier. So God had to do it in such a way that he wouldn't break his righteousness. That is, that the sins had to be pray, paid for, but also at the same time, he had to uh, make a way for that to happen without himself becoming a sinner. And so in order to remain just and yet justify the sinner, there was no other way that it could have happened than God himself coming as a baby, uh, living those 30 years uh, under the tutelage of his parents and then finally starting his mission, uh, ministry, living the perfect life, uh, <clears throat> teaching us, bringing us uh, back to the Father. Remember that was John the Baptist was the preparer of the road, but then Jesus is the road uh, to lead us back to our Heavenly Father. And then actually doing, uh, paying the price that was needed to make it so that God could justify us, but at the same time remain just uh, before any who are looking upon. But who doesn't have questions? Huh? Well, that's why, he's God. that's why he's 
God, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, any more questions before we go on to our last section? Okay, we're going to uh, be looking at uh, Luke chapter 24, uh, now verses 30 through 35. Can somebody else like to read this? Okay. Uh, Donna, you got it? Where are we at? 30 to 35. My Section I three. Years this morning. Section three. <clears throat> it was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Weren't our hearts burning within us while we were talking with while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the, the eleven and those with them gathered together who, who said the Lord was truly has truly been raised with his and has appeared to Simon. And they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he had made them known been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay, notice that the disciples, uh, after this walk and discussion with Jesus, invited him to spend the night with them, which was part of the Jewish law, that uh, they were to be hospitable to strangers, uh, that he agreed. And so they went in, and they're sitting down, and they're getting ready to take the evening meal. Uh, but something out of the ordinary, most of the times it was the head of the household who would lead in prayer, but Jesus took the lead. And he took the bread and he broke it. And we see that their eyes were finally open uh, to Jesus' interpretation of the scriptures. But through his actions, which were reminiscent of the Lord's Supper, uh, for the first time, they saw uh, Jesus who had given his body, the broken uh, body for the salvation of sinners. And it all began to start to come together uh, for them. Now, we know that after this, they ran back and they listened. And as soon as they went in, they were told, uh, the Lord has uh, truly been raised from the dead and he's appeared to Simon. Well, now they had their story to tell back to them. And they related again how, uh, what had happened on the road and how their hearts burnt within them as Jesus was teaching them. Imagine. Instead of having Randy and I as your teacher, to have Jesus as your teacher, uh, you you will learn probably a little bit more. Uh, but notice it says, that be enough, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure would, Barry. <laughs> but, hey, you gave me a chance to rip you guys. Yeah, that's all right. We'll take it. But imagine you know, he went through the Old Testament, relating how the Messiah had to come, and first and foremost had to suffer the first time for sin in order to reconcile us back to God. And so uh, it must have been overwhelming for them to know they've been walking with Jesus, not recognizing him, and then all of a sudden as he broke the bread, uh, as he had done many times, remember the feeding of the uh, 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, and then we said it's the Lord's Supper, and, and many times uh, before the disciples, Jesus had broke the bread. But for some reason, uh, God did not want them to know who this was, maybe to get their true reaction. You know, what they really thought about uh, Jesus' death burial. Uh, and, and so anyway, for whatever reason, uh, we're not told, but that uh, they saw Jesus once he broke the bread and realized who he was, and they were so excited. Now their hearts were uplifted. Now they finally had come to a place where they could reconcile uh, all the teachings and why he had to come and die uh, in order to be raised from the dead, in order to fulfill uh, the tasks that he had been given. Isn't it interesting, too, that he, uh, he prays here the same way he did at the Last Supper and the way he prayed for the 4,000 and 5,000, that always he broke bread, mm -hmm. consistent with prayer. And also, the, the fact that he broke the bread is... is literally a symbol of the breaking of his body and that's when they recognize him <clears throat> and, and God opens their eyes yeah, yeah. and that's why the Lord's Supper should be a very important
heart of the Christian's uh, life of, of the church. Uh, you know, we don't we don't have uh, different commemorative. Uh, we do have commemorative things such as baptism and Lord's Supper. We, we don't classify them as being anything more uh, than commemorative. Uh, but these are important. Notice that Jesus uh, told them, uh, especially where Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, but as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So we need to take the Lord's Supper simply so that we will be reminded in this church, we do it uh, once a month, the last Sunday of the month, uh, to remind ourselves the great price that had to be paid in order to reconcile us to God. I think sometimes we become complacent and, and take God's grace and, and love and mercy for granted. Uh, but this brings us back, at least uh, as often as we do it, to remember what the great cost was uh, in order to bring us back to God. It's also a time, though, when we're supposed to self-examine. Mm -hmm. If there's anything standing in the way of our being able to, you know, Partake. truly partake of that, of that remembrance that uh, we, you know, ask for forgiveness of those things and we try to make those things right and, and we understand where we failed. So but, both of those are remembrances. Oh, yeah. and, and think about oh, this. Oh yeah, guys, uh, guys, the humility, uh, I'm still in awe of how God chose to bring Jesus to us at that point in time in history and, and the humility of it. I'm an animal donkey. Well, None of the Sadducees or Pharisees would expect that one. Yeah. And, and every time I get a little prideful in my own intellect, and believe it or not, it still happens once in a while, and, or all of a sudden I just got to repent immediately. Uh, the humility of what we follow in, in this grace and mercy and faith. Oh, you guys forgive everybody real quick. Don't ever hold a grudge against anybody. You repent real quick and pray that Barry does too. Because if we don't, we lose sight of what Doug and Randy just said, what really happened for you and I. Yep. Yeah, and, and as we do the Lord's Supper, we thank the juice, you know, represents the blood that was spilt, uh, the uh, bread, the broken body. You know, this is to uh, always elevate and to help us to remember that uh, God was reconciling the world to himself through his only begotten son. I want to kind of uh, look at uh, how God's word uh, through scripture and through Jesus himself, because Jesus is a word made flesh, changes hearts and does not return void. Uh, therefore, we should expect that the abiding uh, in God's word uh, in faith is going to result in fruit in our lives. This is why we uh, continually tell people you need to be reading your Bibles on a daily basis because notice the Holy Spirit illuminates Scripture for us, but He also cultivates uh, that Word for good works in us. And so we see that uh, when we understand the depths, as, as Barry just said, if, it's when we contemplate the depths and in Colossians, I believe it is, uh, Paul goes into great detail. He said, oh, I wish you could know the, the depth and the height and the length and the width of all that God and Jesus Christ has done in order to save us and bring us back to himself. Well, as I think about this, I thought about uh, what happened in the book of Luke, and we're just going to talk about it here. Remember, there's a sinful uh, woman when Jesus was asked by Simon, uh, a Pharisee, to come to his house and dine with him, Jesus did. And he walked in, and his disciples, and he uh, went in and sat down, and, and they uh, had his servants uh, serve, serve them. And as they did, a woman walked in, and she fell at Jesus' feet, and she began to cry and to weep. And then she noticed her tears had wet Jesus' feet, and she was embarrassed, so she began to uh, wipe his feet with her hair. And then at the end of it all, she anointed him uh, with oil that she probably saved all of her life for her own burial. 
And at the end of this, the Bible tells us that uh, Simon uh, was indignant about it, thinking, well, Jesus should know what type of uh, woman this was who was touching him. And so Jesus answered and said, Simon, I've got something to say to you. And he said, say it, teacher. Now, don't ask God to show you something unless you really mean it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but notice in Luke chapter 7, verse 41, it says, A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You've judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, notice he turns toward a woman, but he's saying this to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from this time I came in, she, she, uh, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven. Now get this, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. But there are two verses I want you to get. Number 43, he says, uh, Simon, who will love him more? And Simon said, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And then in verse 47, we read uh, Jesus saying, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Now, what he's saying to Simon is, you claim to be a disciple, but you don't think I did much for you because you show it by your actions. I walked in, you didn't do the customary things that Jews are supposed to do. Even if you, you should have had at least your servants do it, to wash my feet, you know, they would give them a coal rag sometimes to put on their neck, they would anoint their head. All this was given to show that they had concern for the person who had traveled. You know, they wore sandals so there would be dust on their feet. And then you greet them with a kiss. Now, he says this woman knew she was a great sinner. Now, if this is really Mary that we had talked about, she probably had seven demons uh, okay. taken out of her, uh, cast out of her, and she probably may have been a prostitute. We don't, we don't really know all about her. All we know is that uh, she's one who realized what a great sinner she was and what a great debt she owed to Jesus, and so she was showing it. But now Simon, who claimed to be a believer, didn't do anything for Jesus, evidently, from what Jesus said, because he didn't love him much, because he didn't think Jesus had did much for him. Now, there's a great lesson for all of us in this. If you think that you weren't the worst sinner upon earth, like Paul, when God saved you, you're underestimating what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. Now, we talk about adulterers, we talk about homosexuals, we talk about abortionists and all these things. But the thing we've got to get down to and understand is that God should have punished us just like the unrepentant abortionist, just like the homosexual, just like the worst sin you can think of. You are as bad as they were at one time. And you were just as deserving of hell as they were. If you think that God just did a little something for you, that he just brushed, you know, a little dandruff off your shoulders or something, you're not going to love him very much. It's not until we realize what great sinners we are. It's, it goes back to where we're talking about the steps of uh, salvation back in the Sermon on the Mount, where the blessings, and the first one is blessed is the poor in spirit. And, and that's talking about blessed is a person who understand he is spiritually bankrupt. We have nothing to give to God. We have nothing to offer him. All we can do is come with our sins in our hands and fall before God and beseech him to forgive us and accept us uh, for Jesus' sake. 
Now, if we don't come that way, and I'm, I'm saying people come a lot of different ways, and sometimes they come as children, and so they don't realize the depths of their sin, sometimes until they're adults. And sometimes some people never come to that place. But if each and every one of us want to have a great relationship with God, we've got to come to the place where we understand that the Bible teaches us that we indeed are all chief of sinners and all really deserving of eternal damnation. And it took God coming in the flesh to take our sins away. There was no other way. Had he not done it, we would all have gone to hell. And so this yeah, is that, the that, great That is so powerful, and, and God bless you, man. You know, I listen to you, and I've been a victim of this with many victims of this through being saved. When we come to a point that, you know, I call them the juicy sin category. What the world does. Oh, that's awful. That's terrible. When we turn that on us, talk to believers, men and women in church, and the self-righteousness that exists in our midst, the murmuring and backbiting and slander that exists in our midst, not just CBC, but the church as a whole. What you just said is so pertinent to our understanding and maturity in Christ is that we recognize our sins and take our focus all off all those juicy ones that are easy to identify, then that's when we will develop together in Christ and have impact <coughs> in the next election. Yeah, but, okay, next week we're going to, uh, Randy's going to lead us in talking about the joy the disciples had after seeing the risen Savior. And so we're going to close with a prayer. So Randy, if you would, please. Father, we thank you again for this uh, day, for the opportunity we have to uh, open your word, hopefully to learn from it, Lord. Let it uh, sink into our hearts for this coming week. Help us in all that we do to honor and glorify you first and foremost in our lives. Uh, we pray for the after service now as the message is brought by Pastor, uh, Pastor Kyle King. And we pray, God, that we can uh, join together again next week, perhaps in better circumstances, um, to open your word again. For all this, we ask in your name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.